Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Arsenal Transfer Talk. As always, I'm joined by Adam Ray Bodie. What's going on, man? Not much, just enjoying the summer window. Excellent, man. I mean, the timing on this one is almost impeccable because we had planned this over the weekend, but we didn't expect for some transfer confirmation news to break right before we did it with Zinchenko joining the club for 30 million pounds and then 2 million in add-ons. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, That was what Ornstein reported today when you got the here we go from Fabrizio. So I guess it's done. Yeah, was there any indication... What was that? I said, as long as he's medically okay. Yeah. I mean, medical pending. It, was there any um, information on length of the deal? Because from my understanding, the team had already agreed with Man City, right? It was mm-hmm. almost opposite of how it usually is, where team had agreed 30 million. And then there was um, just some back and forth nego- negotiation on personal terms. Yeah. And I believe that they did. Uh, I believe that one of the, the bigger guys reported that it was a four-year contract. So Four-year. Okay. 2026. 2026. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay. And so, you know, for you, as always, I like, what, what was your initial reaction to the deal? No, it's, I think it's a good deal. Um, especially coming from a premier league club, uh, you'll get, you'll get people talking about, you know, other players who maybe went for, um, less who are also good. Uh, but you know, I think, I think when you can get a player from a, a club who doesn't need money really, uh, for a fee that, you know, I, I don't really think is, is bad at all for just about any player. Um, and he's going to come in from day one and immediately bring a lot of Premier League experience, which I think, you know, you could say is in pretty short order at Arsenal, um, at least from this past season. So, um, you know, it strikes me, it strikes me as a good deal. One that I was never worried about going too high as, as excited as I was about Rafinha and Lissandro, um, you know, you did, you did get the worry with both of them that it was too much money. Uh, and I have no feeling like that here. Well, likewise here, I mean, just because you brought up Lissandro and Rafinha, I think this, another example of, I think the process for Arsenal has gotten so much better where they're not getting involved in these bidding wars. They have valuations set based on their their scouting and, and their data, and they're not going to go, like, you know, go over that because that's what got them into trouble in the first place. Like with Rafinha, from what I heard recently is that once Chelsea came in, they were pretty much out and they were like, okay, he's just not worth it. So we move on. Yeah. Right. So it's not, I mean, you're disappointed, but it is what it is. You move on. Uh, Lissandro, I was a great player. I know there's been some great memes from Arsenal, from Arsenal fans out there. I'm a, a tremendous player, but the valuation for premier league proven Zinchenko uh, a guy who we'll get into more, but certainly fills the Mikel, you know, that, that style of football for that price is excellent. And I think is also just, you know, I wanted to mention it because we talked about it off air. It really shows also how professional Man City are with their transfers. You know, there, there's no nonsense. It's like, if a player wants to go, if you meet our fair evaluation, we'll let them go. And part of it is the fact that they have obviously a lot of funding and so they're able to do that, but it also creates an incredible amount of goodwill. And that's why players want to come there in the first place. Cause they know, Hey, these guys are actually going to look, you know, let me go to somewhere where I want to go if I don't want to be there anymore. And so I think it's a really, really um, not even, I hate the word shrewd because it, it almost makes it sound like kind of shady, but I, th- I think it's just really good understanding of cultural organization and, and how players resonate and I I just wanted to mention it because it's not something many fans think of when they think of transfers and clubs because players talk and they're like hey you know we want to go to these clubs that treat us the right way and that's human behavior for any company right anyways uh getting back to Zenchenko let's start out with his radar here for his entire career so I'll let you run through this yeah so he's been he's been at Manchester City I believe it was for uh most of five seasons um, racked up a little bit of under 5,500 minutes, which would be, what would that even be? Uh, 50, like 60 games, roughly yeah. total. Right around. Uh, nobody checked my math, but I think that's about right. Anyway, um, you know, at, as you would expect from a, from a fullback um, at Manchester city, they're going to be tasked with a lot of ball progression, both mm-hmm. in terms of carrying and passing. And I would say in both cases, um, 
obviously has shown quite a bit of skill there. I think anybody who's watched him for more than a couple of games can see the, the technicality that he's got to his game. Um, you see, maybe the more scout minded people might say that he's uh, really adept at scanning. So he's, he always seems to be really in control and really secure on the ball. And that, that is going to show up in the miscontrols and dispossessed kind of toward the bottom of the axis, despite the fact that he is going to get a lot of touches on the ball because he's going to be a key in buildup. He's also not turning it over. And I think that's part of why uh, Mikel Arteta would, would value him. Uh, and it's one thing that he has a lot uh, in common with Lissandro is that um, give them the ball and they do not panic. Um, so, so I think that's going to be a real strength of his game regardless of where he's playing, uh, you know, Man- uh, Manchester city, obviously they're going to, they're possessing 60% of the ball. Most of the seasons that he's with the club. So he's not getting a lot of chances to register uh, defensive stats, like interceptions, tackles, that sort of thing. But I think even if he was, he probably still wouldn't get a lot. Um, he's not the most incredible defender. I don't think he's the worst defender in the world. Um, you know, he's got a successful pressure rate. Uh, of about 33% for his career there, which will put him like in the 55th to 60th percentile among fullbacks. So all around you look at him, you say it's definitely more of like an attack minded addition um, than, than it is a defensive one, but Arsenal are obviously uh, getting better in defense this season, bringing back uh, Saliba, hopefully full strength Tierney and Tomiyasu. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what gear he kind of brings to the main 11. Agreed. I think his offensive numbers speak for themselves. Um, you can see on the radar here. I mean, he, he's excelling, especially in that city system. Defensively, he's almost to me like a Jaka in terms of if he's going to be in a one-on-one, especially in transition, you're going to have some trouble. The whole point, though, with guys like him and Jaka are you're playing positional defensive positions, right? To be able to cut out certain things, and that requires a certain level of intellect and awareness and understanding. And that's, in my opinion, is what Mikel is really going for. And so he certainly fits into that. Of course, uh, one-on-one these situations, you're going to find some trouble at times. But to your point, that's also hopefully, you know, with the other guys coming back, you're going to be able to account for some of those situations as well. And I think his offensive game, is more than enough to make up for some of his defensive liabilities. And you can even game plan for some of those as well. And I also mean, potentially, you know, with him getting more playing time, he might be able to work on some of those defensive deficiencies as well, moving forward. Sometimes sometimes, I was just going to say, sometimes um, in a system like Arteta's the best defense will be the ability to hold onto the ball, Mm -hmm. (laughs) kill, kill the defense, kill the opposing defense with a thousand passes as as so many people have said. And I think certainly if you look at a guy who can receive a pass, uh, progress it, if needed, hold it, if needed, find a a runner. um, I think, I think, you know, you can really see him working regardless of what zone he's occupying. You can really see him working well with Gabriel Jesus, who's just shown so much dynamism uh, in the area surrounding the goal. Um, You can, He's, he's got the ball to, that he can put on his feet or his head or wherever he wants it. Yeah, and that speaks to his technical security. And then also you have you know, his, his versatility, which kind of transitions into the next part of here is where is he going to play, right? So let's start with his heat map for City. And mm-hmm. I'll let you run through this. Yeah, I mean, for Manchester City, he's basically always been a fullback, um, basically always left back. You... Uh, it's, it's kind of rare, uh, at least in my experience to see a player who plays so, uh, such a different position than what he was acquired as, and also what his national team uses him as. So, so for for Manchester city, um, if you look at his heat map, you will see it's primarily along that left side. And he's, Mm -hmm. he's an interesting one because if you look at like, uh, the interest in Lisandro Martinez, he is not a left back. Uh, he was coming in as a guy who played center back. In Argentina, came to Ajax as a center back, played center back for Ajax, except for one season when he was like a number six, like holding midfielder. Um, And it was kind of like uh, we were intuiting where he might play. For uh, Zinchenko, this map, I would say, is very uh, like inverted fullback feel. Um, Obviously, a lot of the defensive spaces that he's taking up along the left side in his defensive half. In the attacking half, he's kind of stopping. Right before that final attacking third, occasionally he's overlapping on the left, but really to me, having the ability to do both, uh, both overlap and invert, um, 
makes him a good fit because Arsenal are going to have some different pieces in midfield who have different strengths. So um, it's interesting to kind of see see that a little bit more directly. We don't have to imagine it like we did with Lissandro. No, exactly. But I think the fact that obviously Arsenal went in for Lissandro and then immediately pivoted to Zinchenko, they're clearly going for a certain profile, whether you want to call it, a, a, you know, it doesn't matter. Positionally, we talk about positions, but a lot of it now is all about, right, like you said, what zones you're playing, what profile you have, and what mm-hmm. skills you can bring to that position. And, and those two guys, I think, to me, are, are players who can adapt. They have the skill set to be able to adapt to anything around them rather than you having to adapt to that player, which then limits your playing style a little bit, right? And mm-hmm. so I think that's really what he was looking for in this regard and and so and then whereas and also gives you versatility to play in multiple ways because you still obviously have a Kieran Tierney and so you can go match by match and be able to have these different tools to use which not only makes it really you know a lot easier for you to attack opponents weaknesses but on the on the opposite end they're not really sure what you might come out with either right so it gives you a, a double advantage as well in that regard. And then now moving on to, uh, you mentioned his, you know, what he plays for his, for Ukraine and that, well, let me bring up that heat map and then have you speak Mm -hmm. to that as well. Yeah. in the, in the world cup qualifying um, bout here for Ukraine, they they did come up just short, but he uh, basically occupied the space of the left eight, right. That we've Mm -hmm. been talking about. So it kind of creates an interesting, uh, an interesting question for Arsenal fans and, um, as much as the, uh, the guy who wants to know everything in me would like to be able to plug him in and just say, he's going to be left eight or he's going to be left back. Um, I think that having this element of mystery where, uh, he basically was playing like a box to box left eight for the Ukraine, uh, or for Ukraine rather, um, that is, I think, a like we said, kind of a, a weapon that Mikel Arteta can weaponize. Um, he can really utilize to our advantage. You can, I mean, I can think of three or four guys who can all play on the left side with him, Kieran Tierney, Granite Jack, Emil Smith-Rowe, Gabriel Martinelli, depending on which of those three, which of those two is out there with him, mm-hmm. he can play any, any position, basically. Um, if you have a, a Xhaka, Zinchenko, uh, let's say a Smith-Rowe lineup, you could see Smith-Rowe kind of being an inverted winger, Granite Jacka being more of an inver- inverted fullback in possession, and Zinchenko taking up more of the wide space. So it's going to be interesting to see um, how they all, counter or how they all interact and i think that's kind of the point exactly and i think that really just what mikhail is going i think when mikhail got here he was so limited by certain skill sets where i think it was frustrating for him because obviously he's wanted to play a certain way and that's what he's always talked about you need the players to be able to play a certain way and he had guys he really had to compensate for 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 a long time because their skill sets were so limited and i think the tr- the profile is clear. He's going for guys who allow for that versatility, that flexibility to be able to interchange and play in multiple ways and confuse defenses. And so he's going to have so many options to pick from. I and mean, we haven't even mentioned Vieira, right? The new addition. Uh, he mm-hmm. had an interview with the athletic with um, Gunnar Blog, um, James, and he was like, I, I've played left wing, I've played right wing, I've played the 10. It's, just, it's the same thing, right? Being mm-hmm. able to attack attack in different ways. And I think Zinchenko clearly you know, fits the bill in that regard. And then with all the other intangibles that Mikel knows about him, again, another city guy he was there with, right? Like you mentioned his link up with his Zeus, not just on the pitch, but also off the pitch as well. And so you know, those are all cohesion and, and chemistry aspects that, you know, that can make up, give you greater margins to work with. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it's, it's interesting because there's been a lot of kind of speculation on what this means, right? This, this is the left eight signing. This is the left back signing. There are no other defenders. There are no other midfielders uh, coming in. Everybody's kind of all over the place, but I think one, one point that's important to make is as a 25 year old uh, international um, looking for more playing time, it is not hard to give that to an Alexander Zinchenko. His his highest number of league minutes in his entire Manchester City career in one season is about the same amount that Cedric played last season for Arsenal. Uh, that is not hard to beat. He can start 
one out of uh, maybe two out of about five games and, and, and clear that. So I think there's kind of that line between every game starter and rotation piece that you're going to see um, Arteta really walk with a few different guys. And, um, you know, I, I really, I really would not be surprised at all to see kind of like the hot hand philosophy taken the guy who's playing really well can, can continue to start, you know, if you want, uh, if you want your time, you better take advantage. I think it was, uh, in regard to Saliba, um, there was an interview where Arteta said that, um, we're going to play the players. We're going to get, get us where we need to be. Um, and I think, you know, you see that in the, the center back rotation too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think. You know, in those in those skill positions outside of Jesus, just because there's no other really, um, you know, nine up there, you're going to see a lot of that that competition. And like you said, playing the hot hand, playing the guy who gives you the the best advantage in that match. And I, I'm, I'm I'd be I'd be very surprised if you know Arthur hasn't spoken to his guys about that, right? Because he always talks about competition, and so I don't think it's going to be you know some new. Uh, you know, so su- surprised to Alexander that he has to come in and, and really work for that. And he's used to that from City. Pep, I mean, Pep and Michelle shares a lot of the same mentality and approach, mm-hmm. obviously. So I think he's not going to be, that's not something that, that will be, he won't shy away from that competition mm-hmm. as well. I was just going to say to not be a starter is not the black mark on your record that it might have been. Um, not only just because of the way that tactics have changed, but also with the, the, um, the advent of the five substitution rule, I think you are going to see uh, a lot more kind of tinkering with lineups mm-hmm. uh, toward the end, or maybe, I mean, maybe you'll even see more halftime subs. Maybe you'll see more 50th minute subs. So it's going to be interesting when you have, it's one thing that's, I think everybody can agree on is when you have more quality on your subs bench, you're more likely to use it. Uh, especially if somebody isn't looking fresh or picks up a, you know, a, a small kind of uh bothersome injury so yeah and especially with i mean you have a winter world cup for the first time which kind of just throws everything for a loop right so mm-hmm. you're gonna you're, you're gonna be there's variables we have coming up this season that you've never ever had before and so it's always yeah. good like you said to have that quality of depth we already know that the issues arsenal have had without having that depth for example like tomiyasu his people talk about him being injury prone. The reason he was, he got injured is because he tried to play through an injury because Cedric was, had a hip issue and there was no one else to back him up. And so that's why he actually ended up being hurt. So when you have depth, you're able not to just have obviously better players, but you're also able to limit injury risk and not have those downstream effects. That's a whole different topic. Um, so uh, any closing thoughts on this move for you? Yeah. I mean, it- I just think I think it's one of those moves that um, we will probably look back on in a few years and say that it was just a really smart piece of business. Um, I, I've kind of over since Rafinha and Lissandro have happened and kind of fallen through, I've been kind of looking back over the past few years, who are the guys that are going for the big money, right? Because those are going to be the bidding wars. And I mean, frankly, most of the time, those past couple of years, uh, those guys are not play. I mean, you know, it's not like every 30 million pound sale is an incredible player, but, um, you know, you do have to take it, take into account that these things are not, they're not guaranteed to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have any guarantee that, uh, that Lissandro is going to be a good center back for Manchester United or Rafinha will be, would have been a good winger for Arsenal just because he had done it in one system. Everything is always changing. So, um, this is one where you say, you know what, I think that this is probably a smart, a smart, just a quality player coming in for a quality number. Um, I think opposing fans who don't take the time to really get to know the player might might think, make fun of it because, you know, he wouldn't start for us or whatever. I think I've already seen some of that talk out there, but I don't think that's really what every transfer is about anyway. So uh, it's one very easy to be happy about. I was happy back in whenever June when it was first rumored and, and it's exciting to see it happen. Yeah. And I, I share those same thoughts pretty much exactly. I, I think even just seeing the addition of, you know, Gabriel Jesus and how much he's changed just in, you know, he, he, his technical quality, his movement, his ability to see things has already changed. You can already just see the change that there's, there's a just flow guys are moving. You know, Zinchenko is the same way, man. He's used to playing at a very, very high level and it just changes the quality of the team. And mm-hmm. they're, they're also training with these guys too. So they're raising their level 
you know, training with these guys and seeing how they train as well. So there's this knock on domino effect and you know, everything, the way that football works, stuff doesn't happen overnight. It's at a phase shift, right? So it slowly, yeah. slowly builds and then it almost clicks and you're like, how did this happen? No, it's been building now, you know, with this Arsenal team for a while. And we'll see obviously what other transfers that they make. Well, you know, we'll have more videos on that. And, but as always, Adam, and I appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So for anyone who doesn't know Adam or doesn't know his Twitter, head on over, check him out on Twitter. He's always posting stuff up, um, you know, with his uh, radars, with his thoughts. He'll have pretty in-depth kind of threads on players. Some you may have heard of, some you may not have heard of. Certain guys that he likes who Arsenal probably haven't even heard of yet. And so um, appreciate it. Uh, what was that? I hope they've heard of everyone that I'm <laughs> I'd be pretty upset if they hadn't. Right. I'm I'm sure they have. I'm sure they have. And so, as always, for myself, I'm Raj, 3CB Performance. Uh, Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you next time.